Greetings, folks, and welcome to the Electro Maker Show. This is your midweek roundup of all things Maker and Embedded, and, well, lovely. As you can see, I'm sitting down, and I don't usually start the show like this, and there's a couple of reasons for that. The first is, as you can see in the background, there is still madness in the studio up here, and that is because I'm still working on the new studio. However, the hardware setup is finished. Uh, just off screen to my right is my new rig. Uh, it is working perfectly, as far as I can tell, and it has a number of advantages. Um, I'm able to now swap between the screen and the camera just on the fly, and we can even do some of this picture in a picture malarkey if we really feel like we want to um, and yeah the other reason I'm sitting down is because as mentioned last week because of lockdown restrictions I am full-time parenting during the day and I am once again recording the show at night so apologies in advance if I slip over any words while I am tired anyway all that said we have a full show once again for you this week including a mystery box competition so let's get started Hey folks, this is Future Editing Ian here with a very quick note, if you can hear that high-pitched whine in the background. That is going to be present for this show, I hope it isn't too annoying for you, there's not much I can do about it right now, because as I mentioned later in the show, uh, the computer is right next to me uh, now, it won't be forever, I apologise if that puts you off a little bit, but this won't be an ongoing problem. Anyway, uh, enjoy the show. And we're going to start this week with a few projects I've seen over the last seven days or so that caught my eye. And we're beginning with an absolutely tiny little PDP-11 terminal uh, inside a VT-102. And when I say tiny, I mean absolutely tiny. Um, so yeah, um, I, I came across this through the uh, Hackaday blog. Um, and just to give you an idea as to how small this little computer is, um, this is a video from the creator. So uh, this is Sprite's, mod, uh, Sprite's mods turning on their tiny little PDP-11 terminal computer. Now, as you probably picked up from the title, this is an ESP32, which is emulating PDP-11. And if you aren't familiar with PDP, that's a series of uh, microcontrollers put out by DEC, which I believe is the Digital Electronics Corporation. Um, I did a little bit of reading up on Wikipedia just to refresh my memory. Um, I was familiar with PDP-11, but I don't keep the entire history of microcontrollers in my brain all the time, because how could I? Um, but yeah, as you can see, this is a working tiny little terminal, um, and uh, it is a very cute beast indeed. And this is the brainchild of Sprite's Mods, who have a very in-depth build on their website. Um, it goes through the uh, idea behind it and uh, how it came to be. Um, it's kind of interesting, actually, that this is another product of a uh, lockdown. Um, this uh, 2020 has been a weird year. In my specific case, it meant being away from my home in Shanghai, as we were in Europe at the time COVID hit, and China did not make it easy to return. Um, and yeah, long story short, they had a bunch of ESP32 development boards around and decided to emulate PDP-11. Now this is a very long and in-depth blog post and I won't go through all of it, um, but as you can see down the side there are several pages um, and uh, yeah, the second page is uh, running Tetris interestingly enough and uh, yes they did get uh, the original terminal version of Tetris running uh, which is of course a very very nice thing to see um, and uh, there's a lot more to this project than I'm going to be able to give any time to because it is so incredibly complex but let's just say this wasn't particularly simple to do um, as the first uh, paragraph here says there are uh, a few memory issues uh, with the ES P32, uh, regardless of it being an old system, uh, you aren't supposed to be running it on a microcontroller like an ESP32, and there was a little bit of stripping down to be done first. And not only that, um, this isn't just a, a software thing. This isn't just someone who's uh, decided they're going to emulate some software. They've made a very beautiful build for it too. Um, as you've seen, this really is a beautiful little tiny replica of the VT-102, right down to the logo here, as you can see. And uh, the build goes through how they did that as well. Um, so yeah, as you can see, here's the VT-102, and uh, it t takes you uh, through how it was all put together in OpenSCAD and printed using a resin printer. Um, and uh, as and as someone who's uh, played with a resin printer a fair bit, um, yeah, uh, they can be a little bit touchy to get working, but once it all came together, it did look very, very beautiful. Now, just in case this is ringing a bell with any of you, this isn't the first time that Sprites Mods has done something like this. Um, I remember at the time seeing when this was being passed around. Um, this is a tiny, tiny little Macintosh 2. Um, and as you can see, when you put it next to the full-sized one, it's really a diminutive and lovely little thing. Um, I have a lot of time for this kind of uh, take an old big computer and make it as small as you can. Uh, I think it is a lovely project. Um, and uh, I, as I say so often in Sound Like a Stuck Record, um, Sprites Mods is a website that you can get lost in and read some very 
very interesting things. Um, and I learned a little bit about uh, just the process of putting something like this together, as much as the complexity of this singular project uh, from this very, very well put together write-up. Um, and so what I will do is link the Hackaday article as that links out to all of the important uh, articles that you can find. Everything that I've opened here, rather than the, other than the Wikipedia page, you will find by following the link on the Hackaday article, which I will leave in the description of this video. Next up we have a project from Robo Penguins, and this is a cat-based project, which makes it a double win in my opinion. Um, yeah, anyone who's owned a cat will know that they can be rather demanding, and once they know that they can get you to do something, they will ask you to do it. In this case, uh, this is a cat that knows it likes to lie in the sun, and will ask for the chair to be moved to stay in the sun. Uh, Robo Penguins wasn't having that, and decided to automate the process. Now, what you are seeing here is a time-lapse video, and I've even sped up the time-lapse video. Uh, so this is uh, sort of a proof of concept, because, uh, yes, there's a motor on one side of the room and a lead attaching it to the chair, and, uh, yeah, as soon as the motor moved, the uh, cat got scared, <laughs> and so uh, the cat ran away. But you can see the proof of concept here. Um, essentially, the spool spools in, and then the chair moves. And uh, it does look a little bit jerky, that's just because of the time-lapse. And also, as I said, I'm speeding this video up. But um, the proof of concept is not the interesting thing here. The interesting thing is the build process. And the build process starts with the inspiration for it, which is a broken coffee grinder, because the motor in the coffee grinder still worked, and you know how it is when something breaks. I don't know if you're like me, but I'm very hesitant to throw anything away that has electronic components in, because maybe I'll be able to make something with it. And if you're anything like me, that'll lie on the side and not be touched for a while, because you don't have time to get around to it. Uh, this is a perfect example of someone who did have time and decided to use the motor to automate moving the chair. Now, uh, in the end, Robo Penguin ended up using a different motor that would be better for the job. This is something that I found really fascinating is that they laser cut uh, gears in order to make it work um, because the geared motor that they ended up using would have been uh, completely the wrong speed to move the chair in a proper way um, and so yeah uh, this is what they ended up going with in the end and um, I'm a big fan of wooden gears um, there's a, a, another maker youtuber uh, who works primarily with wood called Matthias or Matthias Vendel uh, you may have heard of him he's a Canadian fella who makes tables and all kinds of wonderful stuff he did a whole series on wooden gears and I've always been a little bit interested in them since then it's something I'd love to have a go at myself one day. And of course the other side of this is uh, detecting when the sun is shining on the chair. And uh, the way this was done was actually quite clever. There wasn't one light sensor, they used three. They had one in the window and two on the chair and they did comparisons between them to work out when the sun was uh, lying on the chair and when it was not. Uh, that was then uh, fired uh, via a node server uh, to the microcontroller which would then pull the chair the adequate amount to keep it in the sunlight. But yes, this is a very fun and inventive project and uh, it's a pretty noble cause I'd say. Trying to keep a cat happy is not an easy thing to do and doing it using maker knowledge is yeah, a pretty cool thing altogether. So um, I will leave a link to the Robo Penguins website in the description of this video. Uh, this project is uh, uh, is very, very well highlighted on here. I forgot to mention that all of the code is here as well. Um, this is a, a very, very thorough walkthrough. And uh, there is also the blog and portfolio of Robo Penguins, which is definitely worth a look through as well. Up next, a project which is a reaction to that meme in the Arduino community. Uh, if you are on the Arduino forums or any forum for any amount of time, you will see someone who is either earnestly or saying, just for a joke, uh, why use an Arduino when you could just use a 555 timer for that? Now, I'm sure there's legitimate reasons to say that, but a lot of the time it does feel like trolling. And that's why this is such a cool project. <laughs> This is an Arduino using a 555 timer as its microcontroller. So why use an Arduino when you can use a 555 timer? Well, now you can. But yes, uh, as it says in the tin, uh, why use an Arduino when you could just use a 555? Well, here you go then. Enjoy. And amazingly, this is a 555 timer with the footprint of an Arduino, and it kind of works with the same pinout as well. Now, the project for Trollduino is on Hackaday.io, and by the way, uh, Trollduino is a fantastic name for this project. I absolutely love this. This is hilarious. Um, and yes, as you can see, this is a 555 timer on a Arduino board. Um, now, as you can probably see from the images here, uh, it is ping compatible with Arduino headers, but uh, expecting them to work might be a little bit too much to ask. Um, but yeah, uh, this, uh, as you can see, there's spaces for uh, resistors and capacitors, which is how you uh, program this. Uh, you're not going to be using any newfangled ID here. No, this is a proper hardware programming. Um, and uh, yeah, this is just such a funny project. I love it. Um, as it says down here, this is version one of a silly joke. And note that the use of Comic Sans is not an error. 
So yes, this is the perfect troll answer to people who say you should be using 555 timers in place of Arduinos. And I should be clear, um, there are definitely times where you should use a 555 timer instead of an Arduino, but for people like me, um, I like the simplicity of being able to just plug an Arduino and encode it to do what I want without having to, uh, yeah, mess around with resistors and capacitors. I mean, as you can see here, the... Uh, Trolduino adapted blink sketch as install the following code by uh, adding resistors uh, across the lines here as you can see as I mentioned before here are places to whoops here are places to put capacitors and resistors um yeah there's so many things about this project that I like but the main thing is yeah it's the Trolduino it's 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 designed to be a troll project it's designed to be funny I love the fact that there are boards like this just appearing now uh, last week on the show we we covered the brain fuino which is a board that actually uses brain Feck, um, as its primary programming language. That is what you use to program the chip on the board. It's an FPGA, that's how they did it. This is, yeah, a, a similar thing. This is just uh, a sense of humor and electronics know-how, and it's everything that I love about my particular part of maker culture, because at the end of the day, uh, we all like making beautiful things, we all like learning, but we all like having a laugh as well. So yes, I'll leave a link to this in the description. It's well worth a look if you'd like a laugh. Now this is another themed project, and the theme is Tiny. Uh, tiny in two ways. This is a Tiny MP3 player. Now, of course, it's not as small necessarily as some of the Tiny MP3 players that were so popular a few years ago, but this is based on the AT Tiny 85 chip and those little uh, DF player mi uh, micro SD cards, uh, micro SD card slots that have MP3 decoding in them. And as you can see, it's a little 3D printed enclosure with a speaker on one side, a LiPo battery in the middle, and the board on top. And uh, yeah, as mentioned, it runs on the AT Tiny 85, has this tiny little OLED screen here, um, a little rotary volume dial, a few buttons, and the aforementioned micro SD card uh, holder. Now this project is by Stefan Wagner um, and it is documented here on YouTube um, and uh, the YouTube video I actually found by uh, from the GitHub page for this project. Um, the GitHub page talks about exactly how it all works um, and uh, yeah, I, again I could go through every detail of this. I'm not going to. There's no need. Um, it, you know what it does and uh, if you are like me uh, interested in doing interesting things with uh, maybe slightly smaller or uh, less hardware than usual I can't think of anything small in my mind than running this thing on an AT Tiny 85. Although why didn't they run it on a 555 timer? You could have used a 555 timer for that, couldn't you? No, but all jokes aside, this is a phenomenal project. Um, it uses a familiar chip to many of us. Um, as I've mentioned on the show a few times before, I am quite into the idea of using more AT Tiny 85 chips in my general microcontroller life. I have bought a few now, I just haven't had the time to play with them. Um, and I noticed once I bought one that I've had one sitting around uh, on an, uh, in a, a random corner for a long time that I had forgotten about. But anyway, that is all besides the point. If you are interested in this project, it is all here on the GitHub page, which I will link in the description. And if you want to find the YouTube video we were just looking at, at, the project video is linked here along with the project files. Just briefly, I am also aware that Ben Heck is building an AT Tiny 85 games console and I will be featuring it on the show. Um, it's one of those things that I actually put it aside on YouTube to watch later because I thought, oh, that's cool. I'll watch it in my own time. Um, and just in the nature of putting the show together and producing it, I haven't got around to it yet. We'll probably cover that one on next week's show. Now, for the many of us that lived through the retro gaming era, retro gaming today is enjoyed primarily by adults. And what goes better with retro gaming than drinking booze? Name a more iconic duo. Well, this is a project that takes this entirely to heart. This is a booze barrel with a retro pie arcade built into it. Now, perhaps unsurprisingly, this uses a Raspberry Pi. It is, in fact, from the Raspberry Pi blog. And this is a uh, user Bread Tangle on Reddit, who, uh, yeah, uh, beautifully crafted this beer barrel come arcade machine come drinks cabinet. Uh, that is a fantastic uh, sentence with a, a nice amount of hyphens in it. But yes, the build uses a Raspberry Pi 3, and in many ways it is a very standard retro Pi build. Uh, you see a lot of builds with uh, these uh, fantastic light-up buttons and uh, uh, movement sticks, uh, which are actually relatively cheap to get. Um, if you are interested in getting them, uh, you can find these things on AliExpress and various websites, and you aren't going to have to spend a huge amount to get these things up and running. Um, I was surprised when I bought a whole job lot of these buttons for making uh, different kinds of controllers, including my uh, editing controller, which I haven't given you an update on in a while. Maybe I'll do that in next week's show. Show. Um, but yes, uh, so you have the normal RetroPie build. The thing that makes it interesting is that it is inside this beautiful old barrel.
One interesting thing about the build is that it runs RAS Spotify, which is a Spotify Connect client for the Raspberry Pi, which allows you to stream tunes uh, from your phone. Um, and uh, the article here uh, shows you the uh, installation script, so you can just download it straight from the terminal if you are interested. Um, RAS Spotify is a project that I've been uh, familiar with for a while and I haven't actually looked into, and there is a link to the GitHub here. Um, I imagine some of you might find that interesting in and of itself. Uh, if you are a Spotify user, being able to just grab it using the Raspberry Pi command line is something that is kind of uh, interesting. There's a few possible things whirring away in my head as to how that could be used. There's also a link in the article to Bread Tangle's post on Reddit about it. This is originally found on the Raspberry Pi subreddit and then reported on through the Raspberry Pi blog. Um, I'm having that fun Reddit issue where it isn't showing me images again, but don't let that put you off. Um, if you do want to see what the maker has to say about it themselves, you can head over here and they are in the comments section uh, answering all kinds of questions. And it also has a sort of write up here. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, as I said before, in a way, this build isn't actually all that complicated. It's very, very similar to a lot of different retro builds. And this uh, build in a table is something that is very popular. Um, I remember that when I was just starting to get old enough to start going out to pubs and things like that, these things were already starting to be a little bit old. Um, I'm kind of in the middle age of retro gaming, as it were. Um, but I remember them being in a few pubs local to me and finding them kind of amazing. Um, and this sort of build is a very popular style of build. As I said, it's the fact that it's in the beer barrel. It's the fact that it has the drinks cabinet in it. And the Rasp Spotify uh, addition is also pretty nice as well. So I will leave a link to the Raspberry Pi blog post in the description and from there you can find your way to uh, Bread's Tangles Reddit page if you want to, as well as the Ras Spotify GitHub if you want to install that on your own Raspberry Pi. Now we're going to move on to a video from Volus Project, who we featured on the Electromega show a couple of times before. But this video is a little bit different, because it's almost like a promotional video for the M5 Stick C Plus. Um, it's a review of it, um, and uh, I'm not sure if this is an affiliate thing or not, and in my opinion it doesn't really matter, because uh, this is a thorough review, um, and it goes through the differences between the old M5 Stick C. Um, just uh, for those of you who that aren't familiar, the M5 Stick C is a ESP32 powered board with a little screen and a battery in it, basically a nice little standalone microcontroller in an enclosure that you can program to do whatever you want. And as you can see, Volus Projects has used it to make a one-button game, which is basically a bit of a dodging game. Um, and uh, this isn't the first time that we've seen this. In fact, the last time that we featured Volus Projects on the show is because of an ESP32 watch that he put some games on, which probably used some of the same code. And there's not all that much more to say really, other than this is a cool project from a creator that I've been following for a little while. If you cast your mind back to when we first had Volus projects on the show, it was the Arduino calculator, which was a custom PCB using an uh, AVR chip to make a simple calculator. And I remembered saying at the time, what a nice simple project that was in order to learn how things work. Um, this is of course something a little bit different, but um, rather than just be a, a general review of it, um, as I say, there's some games that he has made for it. And if you're interested in getting those, there is a GitHub uh, for this this one button game uh, that we uh, just saw at the start of the video. Um, if you are interested, uh, there'll be a link to this in the description. And if you're interested in the M5 Stick C+, Plus, uh, which I certainly am, he has a bang good link here. Um, as I said before, I have no idea if this is an affiliate thing and I don't particularly care. The video itself is very, very interesting. Now, so far on the Electromaker show, we've mostly stuck with microcontrollers uh, for projects, and we've deviated a little bit here and there. We've done some stuff uh, which is a little bit more commercial. One of the things we haven't really covered is the side of maker culture, which is just purely making stuff. Um, and in this case, we are talking about making stuff with large bits of metal, namely Thor's hammer. And when I say making Thor's hammer, this isn't a foam core project. This is solid steel welded together to make Molnir, 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 nailed it. Now, um, as you can see, this is solid steel plates that are being welded together. And if I skip ahead just a little bit, you will see that this is a striking resemblance to the powerful hammer of the Thunder God. And the build doesn't stop there. Um, as you probably know, if you have watched uh, any of the Marvel movies with Thor in it, or actually know the real deal and have done a little bit of research on your Thunder Gods, you know that Molyneux is a very, very beautiful hammer. Um, it is engraved with lots of uh, beautiful iconography, and there's probably a lot of meaning to it that I am missing and I don't know enough about. Um, I'm not as up on my mythology as I could be. Um, but yes, as you can see here, uh, he's sticking this on so that he can carve into it and actually get a properly carved 
properly steel, properly proper Thor's hammer. And uh, as I've said, yeah, this isn't the kind of thing that we've covered so far on the Electromaker show, but if you are interested in hardware projects like this, um, they do show up in my feed from time to time, and I, I do love watching stuff like this as much as I love watching anything else. Um, there's a certain part of this, and the same kind of thing that uh, appeals to me as it does for the uh, Adam Savage One Day builds. Just seeing someone make something from scratch, uh, regardless if it isn't 100% the kind of thing that I'm doing in my spare time, is something I find very, very calming, and of course, very, very impressive. Now this build is from the Let's Build Something YouTube channel, a channel I hadn't heard of before, and by the looks of things, not all that many people have. Um, but there's certainly a channel I will be following from now on, because the level of detail that's gone into making this is a thing of beauty indeed. And uh, yeah, uh, as you can see, it certainly does the business. Uh, that is a very, very smashed... What is that? Squash? Cantaloupe? Not sure. And just for good measure, a pumpkin too, because uh, as you noticed, I'm uh, having uh, a few internet issues, a few uh, buffering issues, but oh, a pineapple as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's quite a mighty hammer. Uh, Let's Build Something is clearly a talented maker. Um, I would suggest going and giving them a follow on YouTube. I'll be linking this video in the description of the video. And uh, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily do anything to annoy this person because they have a massive steel hammer. And it is time for the mystery box competition once again. Uh, this week, uh, because of the madness that is this studio, the mystery box is actually gone. And for the first time ever, uh, I know what prize I'm giving away before I am giving it away. Uh, it won't always be like this. The mystery box will return in its full glory soon. But for this week, just quite simply, I'm going to tell you that we are giving away an OK Do E1. Now, uh, this is a fantastic little development board that I covered a very long time ago. I believe when I covered this on the Electromaker show, it was called the uh, midweek maker roundup and it was a written article it was before the show was even actually a video show on youtube as it were um, and uh, in short these are very very powerful little development boards and just very briefly, if you are not familiar with it, uh, OKDo OK is the first board from OKDo.com, OK who sell a lot of other boards um, and things in their online store. It's the first development board that they have put out, to my knowledge, and as you can see here, it is an ultra-low-cost development board based on the NXP LPC55S69JBD100 Dual Car Arm Cortex M33 microcontroller. Uh, now, uh, there is uh, a uh, there are, is an IDE designed spe specifically for working with this board. Um, and there is also a fantastic YouTube series um, that I will be happy to link to the winner if they're interested in getting started with it. Someone who seems to really know what they're doing with microcontrollers has put out just a little series as to how to get this thing up and running. But anyway, as always, we have a prize and it is now time to pick a prize winner. And this week's winner is Brian C. Congratulations. Uh, we'll be getting this OKDo OK E1 development board out to you. We'll be in touch to find out your, uh, your address. Um, and by the way, I absolutely agree. The Pi Boy XRS looks very, very cool. Um, and I have exactly the same problem. I haven't bought a Raspberry Pi based handheld console because I keep thinking, I'll just build one. I've got all the bits. But what I don't have is any time. Um, and so, yeah, I absolutely understand that sentiment. But yeah, once again, congratulations. And we'll be getting this board out to you. Uh, the Mystery Box competition will continue. Uh, there may be a couple of weeks lag while we get it all set up again. Um, and so uh, apologies if you comment on this week's show and it turns out there isn't a competition next week, but um, we can't really have a competition without prizes and we're in the process of replenishing the stock as it were. Ooh, I think I just hit my microphone. Let's hope that doesn't become a theme for the show. Speaking of the show, let's get on with the show. <laughs> And now we are going to have a short funding website things. Uh, we are over here on Crowd Supply with Little B, which is a project that's actually been around for quite a while. And I'm not sure how I didn't get around to uh, talking about it already. In short, Little B is a small uh, current sensor, current and magnetic field probe. Um, and uh, in itself, that might not be something that interests you specifically. But um, if you've ever looked into getting a current probe, they're actually a relatively expensive thing to get, at least to get a good quality one. And as you can see, uh, you can determine circuit behavior from stray magnetic fields, as it's saying in the video. It seems like a very, very simple thing, and it seems like something that should be very, very available. But from the little bit of reading up I've done on this, it turns out that it isn't. And in fact, this project, uh, as I said, somehow passed me by on Crowd Supply, and I didn't see it on Crowd Supply this time. Um, uh, there's something that I haven't actually mentioned in the show so far, and that is that Crowd Supply has a Discord server, and it's definitely one that's worth joining. 
So I could take you through this page and tell you uh, how little B works. Um, that is a magnetic field sensor, as I previously mentioned, how it measures current and all this kind of stuff. The fact it's an open hardware project and having looked through the page, it does look very interesting. And before moving on, I do want to say, uh, obviously they've smashed their goal. And if you would like to get one, it is $149. Having done a little bit of research on the current price of these kind of things, that is a steal. If you are someone that would uh, need to have a magnetic current probe, a mag magnet sensor, uh, this is something that's worth looking into. I don't work enough with raw electronics really to uh, make it uh, something that I need. Um, maybe I will regret not ordering one of these in a few months time when it suddenly becomes the thing I'm most obsessed with. But anyway, as I said, you could go to this page, but I suggest uh, for once, instead of going straight to Crowd Supply, why not go to Discord first? Now, I will leave a link to the Discord link uh, for Crowd Supply in the description of the video. And if you're not using Discord already, I understand. Uh, it may seem like it's something that's just for gamers uh, and uh, you know teenagers to spend time there rather than other social networks. I absolutely understand that. But they, uh, there is Discord servers for pretty much anything. Most of your favorite makers probably have their own Discord server too. And in the case of Crowd Supply, um, obviously this is a bit zoomed in, um, but uh, you'll be seeing down the side, there is a massive list of uh, projects and these are all archives of Ask Me Anythings. These are people who have made things or, or launching things on Crowd Supply and give you the opportunity to drop in and ask them questions in real time. And Little B have uh, done an AMA um, and the AMA channel is still active. So you can speak to the people who are making it, hear why they are making it, and just get a few insights into the people behind the things that you are supporting on crowd supply i think this is a fantastic way of getting to know people who are making projects and you can maybe see here why I'm saying we should look at this rather than the crowd supply page. Of course you should go there, of course you should read all of the things that make Little B good, but this I find far more interesting that the person Weston behind Little B is a PhD student in the Power Electronics Group at, Stand uh, at Stanford, and uh, this next little thing down here is that he created Little B as a low cost current probe for their own use. Uh, talked about it a bit online, they realized it would be useful for others and decided to turn it into a crowd supply campaign. And it sounds weird, but that's something that I find easy to forget sometimes. All of these fantastic things show up on Crowd Supply, and yes, I t sometimes talk about the teams behind them and try to get an idea of who these people are, but all of these ideas had to come from somewhere, and they usually come from personal experience. So, of course, I will leave a link to the Crowd Supply page in the description of this video, but I will also leave a link to this Discord server, because it's something that is definitely worth having a look at. And by the way, if you are reluctant to get yet another uh, program on your computer for messaging people, you don't actually need to download Discord. You can use it in the browser if you want. Um, all you need to do is have a Discord account. You click the invite and it will open up this page, but in your browser. Um, I have Discord because, as you can see, I am a member of a lot of Discords at this stage. Um, but yes, uh, this is something that I found super interesting. I can't believe how long it took me to find out there was the Crowd Supply Discord. Um, a little while ago, I covered the Skull uh, CTF. and they they also have done a AMA on here which is able to be read. It is somewhere in there it is. It is in the archive just here and the team behind the Skull AMA are a pretty fun bunch of people as well. There's a lot of nice stuff to read here. It's a good way to get to know the people behind the products that you're supporting. Moving on to Maypole, which is wireless file storage from anywhere. Now, there's a number of things about this that I like. Um, it looks a little bit like a USB uh, drive, and in a way, it kind of is. It has onboard storage, but it is a USB drive that also has wireless connectivity, so it's almost a little bit like having a small network hub that can be plugged into any USB drive. But it doesn't stop there. It also has a tiny LiPo battery on it, so it can just be a standalone file server that is absolutely tiny. The video is kind of interesting because it shows it in a very kind of industrial use. Uh, so this is obviously being plugged into what looks like a loom, I think. Um, yeah, industrial machines, printers, media players, projectors, digital displays, 3D printers, laser cutters, lab equipment. Oh yeah, they're, I mean, by nature of the kind of thing this is, it's gonna be able to be used in a wide variety of places. So as I just said, Maple looks and behaves just like a USB flash memory stick, but it has a secret thanks to the ESP32 at its heart. It also lets you transfer files over Wi-Fi uh, to and from the onboard micro SD card up to 32 gigabytes of data. And like I said, it also can have a built-in LiPo battery um, that connects to it. It isn't actually built into the board itself. I know that may seem a little confusing. Um, if you look at the image here, um, you can attach a LiPo battery to it. Um, uh, not that you would necessarily need that, I guess, if you were just going to be used it plugged into something the entire time. 
time. Um, these things do already exist. Uh, I remember there's one called Air, Air Disc or something, um, which is it does the same thing, uh, which is another commercial product. I don't know how it stacks up in terms of price, but this is, yeah, just a, a, a very simple, well, it's not simple, it's complicated, but it's a simple problem in a very nice way to solve it using the well-known ESP32, a chip that I'm sure you, much like I, am learning to love because of its power and because it just seems like it can do everything. So the technical specifications, as I mentioned, it's an ESP32, in this case, the Pico D4 running at 240 megahertz, um, and it has support for battery charging. Um, it's a, in a way, it's a very simple thing. It's not, it's incredibly complicated. I could not make this thing myself, but um, it's actually quite elegant in its simplicity. And this is an open project in that open software, open hardware, open source. If you wanted to, you could get the design files and build one of these yourself and install the stack from GitHub. Um, but I would suggest not um, if the idea of a tiny and wide wireless USB drive, which is essentially what this is, uh, appeals to you, then why not support the creator? Now, Maypole have completely smashed their funding target, and I've just realized I'm covering the funding target. Um, uh, they wanted $1,500, they've smashed that, they've got 6185 right now, there's still two days left on the campaign, and of course you'll be able to get one of these once the campaign is over. Um, and if you want to get one with a battery, it's only $35, uh, if you want to get one without a battery, it is only $29. And uh, as I've said, um, there's a number of advantages in my mind to, uh, to this project, as well as supporting a, a creator. Um, the, the idea of a wireless USB drive, and this isn't a wireless USB drive, it's a wireless SD card adapter really, because you can whip out the SD card and put a new one in, um, is something so simplistic it would never have occurred to me, and yet here it is, it's small, um, and it's something that I, it, I don't even need to really think about. Um, I, I'm going to get one of these for practical reasons, because as someone who works a lot with uh, different kinds of files, I'm constantly moving files around. Yes, for someone that makes video, 32 gigabytes is a little bit small, but I'm also working with a lot of different different uh, small devices a lot of the time. I'm also having to move files to Raspberry Pis and things like that. Um, I feel like this is a very nice extra option to have when I can't be bothered to necessarily uh, sort a network thing out or just move your normal USB drive around. Uh, yeah, so I will link this project in the description. Um, if any of you are interested in supporting it, you can. And I haven't checked, but probably the maker of Maypole will be active on the Crowd Supply Discord. Uh, this is something that we're probably going to come back to a lot in the future of the show. It's a little bit like I'm a kid at Christmas, I've discovered something new. And we're going to finish this week with a couple of new products. Now, um, as always, when I'm searching for new products, there's uh, various places they uh, turn up, sometimes on Twitter. Um, I sometimes get sent them by people that know I make a show like this. Uh, sometimes I find them on Reddit. Um, and what almost inevitably happens to me is I find these things, I look them up, and there's always an article on CNX software. It doesn't seem like there's a week goes by and that I don't uh, issue the virtues of this blog. And it is a fantastic blog with a Patreon, by the way, in case you want to support them. Um, and this is Watchy, which uh, I talked uh, just maybe last week or the week before about an ESP32 watch and how much I love the idea of e-paper display watches. And here one is. And as it mentions, it is a little bit reminiscent of the original Pebble smartwatch. Now, uh, long before smartwatches got a little bit crazy, and I'm, I'm by no means a detractor of smartwatches, I'm in fact wearing one right now, but it's cold and it's under my sleeve. Um, uh, they are a little bit too feature rich in my opinion. One of the things about my watch that I, I'm not so keen on is that it's completely closed. It is an Android uh, OS, Wear OS device that's very, very difficult to do anything of my own with. It has a color screen, the battery runs out too quick. There's a number of things about it that I don't like. Um, there's still a number of advantages as well, but that's a conversation for another time. Pebble was different. Pebble was an e-paper display, the original watch. Um, it was somewhat hackable. And then like so often happens, it was bought by Fitbit and Fitbit Disc continued it. Anyhow, enough about Pebble, this is Watchy. And uh, as you can see from the mock-up here, um, it is an e-paper display on the front and inside it, it has a little speaker and a vibration motor um, along with a gesture sensor and all of the nice things that you generally find on smartwatches. Although, of course, it's missing some of the bloat that I think is somewhat unnecessary. Um, I, I'm kind of thinking about maybe making the jump to an ESP32 based smartwatch, given that the main things I use my watch for are, well, telling the time, strangely enough, and uh, things like heart rate sensing, alarms and reminders, which are all things I'm fairly com uh, confident that I could implement myself using an ESP32. But um, yeah, uh, this is one of many ESP32 based watches, but it seems to be one of the more compact ones. 
Anyway, once again, this is the ESP32 Pico D4. Um, we've just talked about that one. Uh, a 1.54 inch e-paper display with 200 by 200 resolution and wide uh, viewing angle. Uh, one micro USD port for pi uh, power and programming uh, along with uh, an access accelerometer, a real-time clock, a vibration motor and four tactile buttons. Along with a 200 milliamp battery good for five to seven days for timekeeping without Wi-Fi. Again, that's not too big of an issue for me because like as soon as I turn any one of the features on on my watch is gone in a day uh, that's that's still a massive improvement um, and I'm not against the idea of buying a smartwatch like this and uh, lodging an extra uh, small battery on the back side of the wrist. Um, it's something that I know a lot of people would find really bulky and off-putting and it's something that does not bother me in the slightest. Now, Watchy was a project that was being sold on Tindy, and I say was because it is currently out of stock. Um, you can sign up to get uh, uh, notifications when it comes back in. Uh, one thing I mentioned before, I, I was talking about heart rate sensing. That's something that this doesn't do, um, I, and I knew it didn't do that. I just, my brain got confused because mine doesn't, yeah. Um, so yeah, if you want a heart rate sensor, this isn't for you. But at the end of the day, um, I'm not honestly sure I need to know what my heart is doing all the time. I don't know if it's good for my heart to know what my heart is doing all of the time. Um, but I love this, uh, not just just for the technical and sort of geeky side of it, I actually really like the aesthetics of it. It's just, you know, you have the circuit board, you wire the strap through it, and it just, it looks great. I really, really like it. It's my kind of thing. Um, when it was in stock, it was $44.99 in dollars or $37.94 in euros. Um, and uh, yeah, the Tindy page goes through everything that is uh, important about it. One thing that I haven't mentioned so far, one thing that I haven't mentioned so far is this is once again an open hardware project. Um, so you could just get the uh, files for this and print the circuit board yourself and uh, yeah, just go with it. Just make it your own. Um, I haven't quite taken the plunge uh, uh, to do this with many hardware projects yet. Um, I, I haven't really dug into making my own circuit boards. Uh, I've made circuit boards like from scratch uh, using chemicals at home. It was a horrible experience. It didn't go well. It sort of worked. Um, but since then I've stuck pretty much with just uh, using pre-built things and sticking them inside an enclosure, um, I find that a lot easier to do. There's a lot of great pre-made components out there. Um, but this is one that kind of interests me. And I'm torn here because I really do want to support these people, but they're obviously doing well because they're out of stock. Maybe this is the first thing that I will send off to JLC PCB, um, one of the only YouTubers not sponsored by, to, uh, to get build, um, uh, to get built, sorry. I did say at the start of the show, I'm recording this at night and I'm very tired. Apologies if I've stuttered or said anything wildly wrong during the show. Oh, and while I'm being distracted, apologies if the uh, buzzing from the tower is driving any of you mad. It's certainly driving me a little bit mad. Uh, this whole computer that you can't see right now will be over there in its nice little uh, soundproofed enclosure, which uh, has uh, also good uh, um, cooling in it as well. I've thought this all through. But for now, I apologize if the whirring and buzzing of the computer has driven you a bit mad. Distraction. Distraction over. Uh, if you are interested in getting this watch, I will link the CNX uh, software article uh, because it has a link to the Tindy page in it, along with all of the information that you need. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of these kind of homebrew smartwatches. I'm really interested to see what happens with this one, what comes up next. Um, there's another one I featured a couple of weeks ago. If you are someone who is interested in this kind of stuff as well and you've seen any projects like this, let me know because at the minute, this is my current little kind of obsession session in terms of DIY uh, maker stuff that is actually useful. And to round off the show, we are staying with CNX Software because I uh, I saw on Twitter there was this MKR Windy board and naturally the same thing happened. I went to search for it and this is the best write-up of it that I have seen. Um, it is, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite an interesting little board, this. It's very, very similar to the one we talked about last week, um, which was the MKR Shark. MKR Shark? Oh, MKR Sharky Pro, um, which is, uh, yeah, the one for using Zigbee and OpenThread. This one is for LoRa, which is the long-range Wi-Fi protocol, which, uh, incidentally, you can use uh, without any kind of licensing. Uh, one of the things with long-range communication in general um, is that uh, a lot of it is, well, frankly, illegal. Uh, if you remember the pirate radio stations from back in the day, uh, they didn't have the license to be able to be broadcasting, and that is what got a lot of them in the end. Um, LoRa uh, is different. You can use it. And uh, yeah, it's it's mad. I don't know if you've seen any of the videos that Andreas Spies or other makers have made on it, but you can get up to 20 kilometers of uh, Wi-Fi reception with them. It is absolutely astounding. And yeah, this little board in the Arduino MKR form factor is designed specifically for working with LoRa.
So if you are interested in reading the specifications of it, I suggest you just head over to the CNX software site and read them. Um, there is also um, a little block diagram here. Um, this board isn't actually available as yet. Uh, you can request information and a quote uh, on them from the uh, Media Mediatronics shop, um, but I feel like this is uh, in its very early stages of release. Um, when there is a price on them, we will come back to this. One other thing worth mentioning, as it says here, is the MKR Schalke Pro can be programmed in the Arduino IDE, whereas this MKR Windy board so far uh, cannot be. I mean, there's there's multiple ways that it can be programmed, which are listed here in the article, uh, UART, Virtual USB, or SD Link, um, which won't be a problem for some of you, but I know um, uh, some of you, and, and, and me, really, uh, if I'm being honest, would prefer to use the Arduino IDE for its convenience. Um, and uh, there is also not a price for this yet. I don't know if I already mentioned that, but you have to request uh, a quote. So it might be worth waiting a little bit longer before um, deciding whether you would be wanting to get a board like this or not. I mean, indeed, I don't know if you can actually get your hands on one, but I thought it was definitely worth mentioning because long-range Wi-Fi is a very, very interesting thing. It's something I would love to learn more about, but it's one of the things that might be on the list for when I move to the country and actually have long distances, because unless I stick one of these up a tree in the park and then come home and stick one out of the window in the Attic of Dreams, I don't really have any need for one, but it is a very interesting board nonetheless. So folks, that was our show for this week. Thank you so much for joining me and thank you for bearing with me through this time. It's been a little bit strange having to do the show on laptop and from different locations and waiting for all this stuff to finally arrive to get it set up. Um, hopefully going forward, uh, COVID restrictions aside, we'll be able to have the show as it was in the past with a few upgrades as well, I hope. Um, but uh, as always, I hope you're having a fine and productive week. Take care and I'll see you in the next one.